Hey, good morning, everybody. Welcome to the Praise Family Church live stream. What a privilege it is to get to come into your homes today for this incredible service. We're in the middle of a series called Throwback, and Pastor Tom is bringing us a message called Turning the Tables on the Devil, Part 2. And we are so glad that you are going to be a part of this amazing service. Check out the notes. They're available for today's message on the YouVersion Bible app. Also, we've got amazing things going on for every member of your family. So check out our Praise Kids pages as well as our youth Instagram and Facebook. They're all available for you and your family. Be sure to subscribe to our post notifications so that you'll be uh, notified every time we go live in the future. Like that page on Facebook, ring that bell on YouTube, and you will get our notifications. Thank you for joining us today. Drop a comment below. Let us know where you're watching from and who's watching with you, and we'll be live really soon. All right, come on, praise family. Let's get on our feet this morning. Come on, we've come to worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords today.
Everybody, good morning and welcome to Praise Family yeah, Church. Yeah, we want to welcome you here to Praise Family Church. And if this is your first time, welcome to the family. You know, there's a lot of great churches here in the city of Mobile. And for you to come check us out means the world to us. So Praise Family, make some noise for our first time guests. Yeah. Hey, whether you're watching online today or later on the Kingdom Builders Network, we're so glad that you're joining us. And if this is your first time in person, we got something special yeah, going on just for you. That's right. Hopefully you're greeted and felt at home and received one of our guest cup. And in that guest cup, we have a connection card. We just ask that you fill it out, place it in one of those boxes, and if you do, you will receive in the mail a special gift on the house, which is a coupon for a free dozen donuts of Krispy Kreme. And it is great. And if you don't like that, and maybe you're watching what you're e eating or you're on keto or whatever, <laughs> no worries. Bring your tithe offering and that and put it in my box upstairs, <laughs> and we'll be friends for life. Oh, my goodness. I bet. Well, yeah. we're excited that you're here today. And look, we've got a brand new ministry that we're launching yeah. on Wednesday nights that we're super excited about. It's called PFC Groups. And we want you to get connected into one of our small groups. If you have graduated from high school, you're 18 or above, we've got some exciting stuff going on for adults yeah. here at this campus on Wednesday nights. Now, we've got all of our other regularly scheduled activities that are happening at the same time, but now is the time to sign up for this session of PFC Groups. Uh, we encourage you, scan the QR code on the screen behind us. If you're not the kind of person, if you don't know what a QR code is, we can help Ask you. Ask a student. All right. the yeah. The students can <laughs> help student you. can help you. Or somebody in our How Can I Help Lanyards there prepared today <laughs> to be able to help you sign up to be a part of that. We've got a class going on, a Bible class, as well as small groups for men, for women, for couples, and for young, young adults. Yeah, young adults. So you're covered, right? It's going to be awesome. You're going to be here. So make sure that you sign up and join us Wednesday night as we kickstart this session of PFC groups. That's right. And make sure when you come to the PFC groups, you bring your youth students and kids because we have ministry for all ages. No matter if you're the youngest or the oldest, we have a place for you. And going on right now, we have ministry for fifth grade and below. And we don't just babysit your kids. But we instill the word of God on a level that they can understand because we believe and we stand on God's foundation that every person is created in his image and they will find Jesus get saved baptized, fill the Holy Spirit, and find their, find their identity in Christ, it will not be departed from them. It's super safe. We background check every person that comes in contact with your child. We train our workers, and they love kids, and they love helping kids find their destiny in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Hey, the only thing we need you to do is let them go <laughs> and let them flourish and see what God does in your child's life. Hey, today, Pastor Tom is continuing our yeah. series called Throwback, and today he's doing Turning the Tables on the Devil, Part 2. Yeah. So make sure that yeah. you've got the notes. It's going to be awesome. If you'd like paper notes today, if you'll just raise your hand, somebody will bring you that. we got pen, all your equipment, and a breath mint to make your church experience no awesome. The <laughs> breath mint is also to help make our church experience That's awesome. That's right. So be sure you take advantage of that, or you can check out a digital copy of today's notes on the YouVersion Bible app. Baptism is an important event in the life of a believer. On a regular basis, we have water baptisms during our Sunday services, 
so that our church can celebrate these public proclamations of faith. If you haven't been baptized since you were saved or rededicated your life, or if you have questions about what all this means, you can text BAPTIZED to 251-639-1959 and we'll be in touch. If you're 50 or older, PFC Grant is a ministry designed just for you. Once a month, they have their very own Thursday Classic service, and the next one is this Thursday at 10.30 a.m. Join them for worship, a message from Pastor Brandon, and lunch afterwards. This event is free and no sign-up is necessary. PFC ladies will be attending the Engage Women's Retreat in Springville, Alabama from September 15th through the 17th. This event only costs $150, and you can sign up for this life-changing retreat today by paying your $75 deposit on our events page. To see all of the events we have happening, visit our events page at praisefamily.church forward slash events. This is the easiest place to find out information and sign up for everything going on at PFC. The bigger Praise Family Church gets, the harder it is to keep a record of who is with us in person and online each Sunday. Whether you're physically here in the building or watching from home, you can sign in with us by texting HERE to 251-639-1959. Never signed in with us before? Include your first and last name after the word HERE so we can be introduced. Who's ready to bring their storehouse? So ties and offer to the storehouse of God. Come on. Come on, say let's go. Come on, say it with me. Say let's go if you're ready to bring the word of God. Y'all are old. Y'all got to get with me. Say we let, let's go. <laughs> hey, there's three ways you can give here at Praise. You can raise your hand for the offering envelope, and you can put your name on it and put it in one of our boxes. You can go to praisefamily.church forward slash give. You can give online. Or you can text giving to 313131 or to 251-639-1959. I was thinking about this scripture when it says, bring your tithe and offerings to the storehouse of God. We have a church that believes in tithes and giving. We have a church that believes in sacrifice. We have a church that stands on God's word and the whole word of God. And I'm so thankful for that because of a church that gives, we're able to make a difference. Scripture that comes to my mind, it says, when you give, it'll be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And I just want to, I want to say thank you for being faithful. Thank you for being a believer that stands on the whole truth and not just picking out what you believe and standing on that. But we're a church that's going to go all the way on God's way or no way. Amen? Come on, amen? And because of that, we're able, because of your ties and because of your offering, we're able to launch our bus ministry last Wednesday night to bus in students from the community to our church. Come on, make some noise. We were able to feed them. We fed their hearts, we fed their stomachs, and we fed their souls. We had 127 students show up Wednesday night. Come on, make some noise. We had so much fun. We got, we got, they, they said, Pastor Brandon, we got turned. Look, we got a video of worship, how they just got wild. Look, I mean, you could say they, they, they got on the bus to go back. They say, Pastor Brandon, I've been at concerts. I've been at places. I've never felt that way before. I said, when the presence of God shows up, he is there, and it's a whole different feeling. Let me tell you, we had over 20 students get saved Wednesday night. We had over 60 raise their hands for the altar call. God is on the move. It's because you sow seed. Because you're a faithful tither every week, we're able to do ministry. We're trying to reach every student, every child, every adult, every young adult, every married couple, every old person, whoever they are, when they got breath in their lungs, they have an identity and a specific calling of God. But we have to go and get them. We brought in 46 kids that would not have been here if we didn't go and cast a net and draw their butts here. Hello. It doesn't matter if it makes you comfortable, uncomfortable, if you look like them, you don't look like them, if they're poor, rich, whatever the case may be, God believes in them. God died for them. He sent his son Jesus for them. So the least we should do is go. I don't care if we get to 1,000, to 500, to 2,000 students. That's not my goal. My goal is to seek and find all that is lost for Jesus' kingdom, whether it is Westmobile, Bila Battery, Theodore, Causey, it doesn't matter. Hello? Hello? 
Hello? Y'all, y'all don't get this. We're about to bring out the cow trough and be dunking students in a month. We're going to, my goal is to baptize over 100 students that have taken the call of God on their life. And it's coming. I believe it. Don't you believe that, Jonathan? Hey, Luke 14, 14 says this. When you, here we go, this man, y'all ready? But when you give a feast, invite the poor, the maimed, the lame, the blind, and you will be blessed because they can't repay you, for you shall be repaid at the resurrection of the just. I'm not giving my tithe and my offering to boost up my economic bank account. I'm not paying my tithes and offering to look fresh and have fresh kicks. I'm paying my tithe and and pursuing the kingdom of God so that my friend, my brother, my sister will be with me on the resurrection day. Woo! You're clapping and you're shouting. You're going to put that action where your money is. Are you going to put that action where your heart is? Are you willing to serve? Go, get them, pay it forward. We are going to make a movement that the church of Jesus Christ and the gates of hell will not prevail. And the gates are never going to come close. Y'all get ready. I had a mama stop me when we dropped off the kids at the school. Said, where were you two years ago? Where were you? I said, um, at Praise Family Church. Where were you? My son was here. And no one like you were here to speak the word of Jesus over him. And now he's in Metro Jail for seven years. For seven years. Where were you? Where were you? I said, I'm here now. I'm here now, and I got your son, but also I know the chaplain at Metro Jail, and I'll get the word to him. I'll give life to him. Don't don't neglect. Keep praying. Where are you today? Where are you today? But for me and my house, we're going to bring as many as we can. They might not be able to repay us, but on Resurrection Day, the just will rise up, and the ones we reach will be in the feast with me, eating down on Mama's cornbread dressing. In Jesus' name. Come on, stand to your feet. Are y'all ready? Pastor Tom's words, fire! It's good. And and he's trying to look fresh, too, with his pink flamingo shirt on. Hey, I love you. Hello? Love you. But it's time. It's time. It's time in our giving. It's time in our serving. It's time in our outreach. It's time in our church to bring miracles, the prophetic word of God. It's time for the church to be whole and true and holiness in this. Amen? Souls are coming. People are coming. Come on. And this is, we're going to declare this over everything. Now, I tithe and release the blessing of God in my life. Come on, church. What I put my hand to prospers. I have ideas. Come on. Come on. I am debt-free and part of a debt-free church. I use my faith to do big things for God's kingdom. Come on. I'm always the head. I'm never on the top and never at the bottom in Jesus' name. I feel it in the wind you're about to ride in. You said that you would pour your spirit out. Oh, you said that you would fall on sons and daughters. So come. Oh, 
restoration in this house. You are bringing renewal and refreshing to those who need it right now. Lord, we open ourselves to receive from you. We receive from you this morning, Jesus. Hallelujah. Because this is a house of worship. And this is a place of praise. Where every demon trembles, where we proclaim your name, and this is a house of healing, come on, do you believe it, and our hearts are full of faith, oh, you have our full attention. And you have the final say. Come on, let me sing it out. Come alive. Oh, come alive in the name of Jesus. Come alive in the name 
Greater things are to come in Jesus' name. It's because of you, Jesus. It's all because of you, Jesus. We honor you. We honor you. We give you the glory to your name. Hallelujah. There was a moment when the lights went out and death claimed its victory. And the king of love had given up his life for oh, the darkest day in history. And there on a cross they made for sinners, for every curse his blood atoned. With one final breath, it was finished. Oh, but not the end we could have known. For the earth began to shake, and the veil was torn. Oh, a sacrifice was made as the heavens. See? 
One day every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. And I, I wonder sometimes if we in the church think that all of a sudden we're going to shift from being kind of somebody that observes everything to all of a sudden we're going to just be after him. Let me tell you something. This, You know what this is? This is practice. I believe that we're, pra we're practicing for what we're going to do in heaven because the Bible says day and night they do not cease to say holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Come on. Lift up your voice right now. Raise your hands and let him know you appreciate and you love. God, we honor you in this house. Thank you, Lord. God, we praise you, Lord. All hell, King Jesus. All hell, Emmanuel. He is the author and finisher of our faith. He's the way maker and the life giver and the restorer of our soul. And he's the one that gives us wisdom and direction. He's the one that heals marriages and puts families back together. He's the one that takes his broken bodies and does things doctors can't do. He's the one that is our, he's our, he's our future, but he's our present. He's our present help in the very time of trouble. Come on, how many of you know that? If you're facing something this morning, if it seems impossible, maybe it was everything you could do to even walk in these doors. You've had a tough day or a tough week or a tough month, or maybe you've had a tough life. Let me tell you, you can leave it right here and walk out of this place a different person. How many are ready for that? I want to be different when I walk out of here than when I walked in. Can you raise both hands and let me pray for you. Father, we ask you to move in this house. Lord, for that one who's, who's facing things in their family that maybe no one else understands. Lord, would you just speak to their heart right now. Let us sense and know, God, that we can have our faith and confidence in you. Lord, for that sickness, that disease, that, that thing that seems impossible. Maybe somebody's here and they're praying for their marriage. Or, Lord, they're, they're believing for a miracle in their kids. There's somebody else that has a financial need. There's somebody else that, that is facing difficulties medically. The doctor's giving them some bad news. In the name of Jesus, we take authority over every one of those. Because, God, you're more than able to do exceeding abundantly above all we ask or imagine. So we thank you. We declare by faith today, together we come in agreement and say, it is done in Jesus' name. Come on, give him praise one more time. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad you came to God's house this morning? Now do this. Find somebody you haven't spoken to. If you don't know them, introduce yourself and look at them and say, I believe today's your day. I believe today's your day before you're seated. It is good to see everybody. What a great day to be in God's house. We're glad you're here. It's been a great week. Pastor Brandon was telling me about some of the things that have been going on, and it's just the beginning. It's exciting. And so we're in this series called Throwback, and what we're doing is we're going back and finding messages uh, that, that were impactful for our church, important for our church, and also for the one doing the speaking, that we feel like it was a time God really did some things in our lives. So, so I started this series last week, 
or this message, I should say, last week, part one, and we're going to do part two today. So I'm not going to be able to go back and re-preach all that. You wouldn't want me to because you'd be here a lot longer. Uh, part one, turning the tables on the devil. I, make, I want to encourage you to go back and watch it on YouTube or whatever and so you can catch up. And we'll, we'll kind of give you some basics of that. And this I preached back in 2008. And in fact, it was so long ago, I don't keep notes. I know a lot of people do that. I told you last week, I, I throw my notes away every few years, so I have to get fresh words. So that dropped in my heart. I couldn't remember the whole thing. I just remembered God kind of put that in my heart. And so I had to go listen to it. It's kind of weird listening to myself preach that long ago. I sounded a lot younger for some reason. But anyway, uh, so we're going to pick this up. I believe God has some great things for us. It's good to see you today. Thank you for being here. What a blessing, what an honor to share together today. So uh, let's go right now to the Bible, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I got it in my notes. If you don't have it in your notes, um, you'll see it on the wall. How about that? Verse 13, no temptation has overtaken you except such as common to man, but God is faithful who will not allow you to be tempted beyond, and so by the way, some versions say tried. I won't have a trial. Does anybody have one of those versions? And can I tell you that either one of those is a, a good translation? You know, the Bible is multifaceted, has many layers. The Bible says it's alive, it's active. So you can look at one verse several different ways, and it can mean something to you each time because it's alive. So if you're going through trials or you're going through temptation, this verse applies. Isn't that good? Good to know. Okay, so no, you can't be tempted beyond what you're able, but the temptation will also make the way of escape or that with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. Bear it. Okay, let's pray. Father, we ask your blessing on your word. I ask you right now that your anointing would be so prevalent, so uh, alive here, Lord. God, we, we, we just tune our attention to you, Lord. We will not be distracted. We're not going to allow anything else because we want to hear from you. The enemy would not want us to hear what you have to say. So we're going to make a special effort to hear. We open our ears. We have our heart ready. So that you can plant your word deep in us. Lord, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing to you, my rock and my redeemer. In the name of Jesus, everybody say it with me. Amen. Amen. Whatever you have for a Bible, if you got a Bible, hold it up. If you got a, a phone or a tablet using for a Bible, hold it. If you don't have either, point it at the screen. Because today that's your Bible. Okay, so let's do that. Say this with me. Today, I will hear from God. I make up my mind. I will not be distracted. I will not miss what God has for me. I will not be distracted by flamingos. Did anybody notice that that's the order of the day, apparently, because Pastor Brandon? Well, so I figured Pastor Jeremy missed the Holy Spirit this morning because he didn't wear a flamingo shirt. We really didn't decide this, but we did decide next time we do this, we're going to get him a flamingo shirt with a flamingo about that big for Pastor Jeremy. So, so we're glad you're here, and I believe God has important things for us. And we, we told you that when God wants to do something in our life, the enemy hates it. Okay, so that's what we're talking about. So I learned from a, from a young age, we talked about this a little bit last week, that, that when people would say God did this or God caused this bad thing to happen, it didn't make sense to me because I knew we have a good, good father, and the Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from heaven. So I knew it couldn't be God causing bad things to happen, even though some people say that sometimes. I, and I, I thank God for a, a godly father who is also my pastor who told me the difference between thanking God in everything and thanking God for everything. And there's a difference, right? And so, so the devil wants to convince us that God's behind all of our problems and our troubles and our attacks that come against us. And, and last week we began to talk about how God doesn't cause those things, but he will indeed use those things to turn it for our good. Come on, we got to get this. This is so important, and that's really what we're talking about. And so he, he, he can take every attack, no matter what is big, small, medium size, he can turn that for our good. Everything that he tries to bring against us, if we'll have let our faith and our patience work. Remember that? Faith and patience inherit the promises. We talked about that. And so he says, he, he said, as we read this just now in Corinthians, he said, he said, when you go through this, nothing is too big. It's common. We talked about the difference between common and precious last week. Can't remember, remember that, right? If it's common, it means pretty much everybody's been through it. If they're not going through it, they will. If you're saying amen today, next week you might be saying, oh, me. Come on, right? And so it's common, but it says when that trial or that temptation comes, God says, I, I got an answer for how you can bear it. You can bear it, but here's, here's the answer. And he says it right there in First Corinthians. He says what? 
he'll supply a way of escape. You know what that means? That means God doesn't want you to stay in it. The way you bear it is to get out of it. Huh? You, 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 can, you can bear it because have you been there and said, man, I, I can't bear anymore. God said, well, then let me help you get out of it. How, how many of you have been through something you're glad you got out of it? How many want to be ready to get through something in the future and not have to stay in it? Well, that's what the Word's promising, and that's what we're talking about, and that's where we are today. So, so God wants to understand that even though we go through these things, and although it's really common, because a lot of people are going through these things, we can get out of it. That's the good part. I mean, it's a blessing that we can bear it, right? But it's a, to me, it's a way better. The way I bear it is I get out of it. Come on. Aren't you glad it has the ends? I'm going through something. That means I'm going through. That means I got what? Come out the other side. That's good to know. So today I want to go to Daniel chapter 3 and uh, read one of my favorite stories in the Old Testament. And, and several years ago I began to see this in a different way. And I, I've really never heard anybody teach some of this maybe once or twice. And I began to really study this because along these lines of turning the tables on the devil, this, this kind of story dropped in my heart. And I began to see some things I'd never seen before. So, so let's look at this together. And we'll start in verse 1 of Daniel chapter 3. And I have my Bible with me in the first service, and I left it back there. But I got it in my notes because I get the end of my Bible, and I've got notes in my Bible. And then I start preaching everything in my Bible. So I, I'm going to leave my Bible back there today to try to stay on your notes, okay? Will you help me, let me do that? I appreciate that. All right, so verse 1 of chapter 3 in Daniel says this, Nebuchadnezzar, the king, made an image of gold whose height was 60 cubits. Now, a cubit is about 18 inches. So this sucker was 90 feet tall. That's a big statue, right? 90 feet tall, and its width was 6 cubits, which is 9 feet across. He set it up in the plain of Dura in the province of Babylon, and King Nebuchadnezzar sent word to gather together the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the provinces. I wonder who he left out. Doesn't sound like he left anybody that's important out, does it? To come to the dedication of the image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. So the satraps, the administrators, the governors, the counselors, the treasurers, the judges, the magistrates, and all the officials of the province gathered together for the dedication of the image that King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And they stood before the image that Nebuchadnezzar had set up. And I remember when I was first reading this, I thought, well, why didn't the Holy Spirit just have Daniel write and he made all the important people show up? Wouldn't that be easier? And then it could say, when these people showed up. But what you need to understand is there's a, there's a law of repetition in the Bible. Anything something said more than once, like, like for instance, Jesus in the New Testament if you're reading something, he says, verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you. It doesn't mean that he normally lies. What it means is everything he says is true. But if I say truly, truly, he's like really emphasizes, look, this is, this is something I really want you to get. He does it for emphasis. So the Holy Spirit wants to emphasize something to us here. So that's why he keeps saying the same one over and over and over. So we'll understand this was a big deal. Understand that the Babylonian Empire was the biggest empire, the most important nation at the time, and basically covered the known world. This is incredible, one of the greatest empires ever. So this dynasty was incredible, and the Jews had been drug into this thing. And so they were living there not because they wanted to. They'd been taken into exile. So they're living there. So, so when this king, Nebuchadnezzar, when he said something, it was important. And the Bible, the Holy Spirit wants us to know that every single person who had any influence, had any authority, had any say-so in any matter, had to be there. Are you getting it? So when the king called, they all came. Every official, every administrator, Every satrap, whatever that is, right, they all came. Say they all came. Okay, so they all came, and it's important to the story that we get this. Now, move on, verse 4. Then a herald cried aloud. Now, a herald, that wasn't his name, it's what he did. And, and the, the, the most important characteristic of this person was a loud mouth. Because for them to call out, they had to be heard above the, the hubbub and noise of thousands of people. You know, when we were coming in, we come in on Sundays with a few hundred people, and it's loud. And, and you know, our, our herald is the music starts, so we know service is starting, right? Well, he had to say, all right, everybody, listen up. Anybody got kids? 
How many know you got to be pretty loud to speak louder than three kids? What if you talk about tens of thousands? So you got to have a loud. So this guy, was the, that was his key. That was his anointing. That was his spiritual gift, big mouth. All right, so I would have been good at that, I guess. Anyway, yeah, let's just let that go. Um, he says, to you it is commanded, O peoples, nations, and languages, that at the time you hear, now here we go, remember this phrase, at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and it is pronounced lyre, by the way, lyre and psaltery, in symphony with all kinds of music, you shall fall down and worship the gold image that King Nebuchadnezzar has set up. And whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning fiery furnace. So at that time, when all the people heard the sound of the harp, flute, and lyre, in symphony with all kinds of music, all the people, nations and languages, fell down and worshiped the gold image which King Nebuchadnezzar had set up. Therefore, at that time, certain Chaldeans came forward and accused the Jews. Now, don't be shocked when you're doing something for God and somebody comes along and tries to point out your goodness as if it's a curse. God starts doing something in your life, don't be surprised if somebody that doesn't really understand the things of God gets jealous. Come on now. So they came. They obviously, they, they, they didn't like them, so they're, they're trying to use something against them, kind of like they did Daniel. How'd they get Daniel? Let's make it a law you can't pray, because they knew Daniel prayed, right? So that's what they did. So these, these called beings come, right? And they came forward and accused Jews. They spoke and said to King Nebuchadnezzar, O king, live forever. You, O king, have made a decree that everyone who hears the sound, here we go, of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery in symphony with all kinds of music, shall fall down and worship the gold image, and whoever does not fall down and worship shall be cast in the midst of a burning fiery furnace. There are certain Jews whom you have set over the affairs of the province of Babylon, and there you go, there's what they're upset about. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, these men, O king, have not paid due regard to you. Hmm. They do not serve your gods or worship the gold image which you have set up. Then Nebuchadnezzar, in rage and fury, gave the command to bring Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Now, let me pause again. I used to think he got mad just because they didn't bow down. But do you all know he, he knew who they were? He didn't say, who are you talking about? I don't, no, he knew these people. He knew who they were. In fact, they had incredible favor with him. So he wasn't mad because he found out they didn't bow down. He was mad because he got called on the carpet about something he wasn't thinking about. He made a law that he later regretted because it affected somebody he really cared about. Are you with me? So he gets mad, he calls them. And he says, is it true, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that you do not serve my gods or worship the gold image with all kinds of music? I'm sorry, which I've set up now. If you are ready at the time you hear the sound of the horn, flute, harp, lyre, and psaltery. I think we got that now. In symphony to all kinds of music, and you fall down and worship the image which I've made good. But if you do not worship, you shall be cast immediately into the midst of a burning, fiery furnace. And who is the God who will deliver you from my hands? Again. He said, you're going to fall down and worship my gods. He knew they don't worship his gods before he ever called them in. Are you with me? He knew them. That's important. And we'll get to that in just a few minutes, but why don't you get that in your head? So this king's powerful. Whatever he says goes. I mean, he, he, he barely has to make a statement and somebody's gone. I mean, just, he can just almost be un, upset a little bit with somebody and they're dead. I mean, he, he holds everybody's life in the balance. He's able to do that. The whole known earth at the time, the whole known world followed him and knew, and knew he could do it, what he said he could do. So here's what I want you to get before we get there. There's an essence that, that this goes with every trial. No matter what you're facing, no matter what kind of uh, part of your life it's affecting, whether it's physical or financial or spiritual or relational, the essence of every trial, here it is, the devil comes to steal the word of God. That's really what the trial is about. He's trying to get the word out. He doesn't want us to know. He, he, look, look, you need to understand, it's not a contest between you and the devil. That's why you see in the New Testament, it says, well, uh, even angel of the Lord didn't rebuke the devil. You know why? Because so often we're giving the devil way too much credit. And we think that we're so holy and mighty that he's coming after us. Can I tell you, the only reason he's coming after me, coming after you, is because he can't touch God. And you, you're made in the image and likeness of God. You represent God on the earth. Come on, look at that person next to you. You didn't know God looked like that, did you? Come on. 
He said, you're made in the likeness and image of God. And so the devil can't do anything to God, so you represent God. So guess what he does? He comes after you. He comes after me. He might be mad at God. Look, he doesn't give a rip about us. We're not a threat to him unless we get a hold of what God's trying to get us to get a hold of. And that's what he's trying to do. He's trying to keep us from the word. Are you with me? All right, now, and what he wants us to do is not know the word so that we don't invoke his name in our situation. Have you ever had someone invoke your name? Let me explain. So when I was in high school, and I'll change the names to protect the innocent. So I was in high school, and uh, I had this friend who was quite a character. And we'll call him Ray, okay? Because I can't think anybody I knew named Ray uh, that, that, that would have been in this meeting and this, this time. Well, this guy was... He was just do anything for money. And when you have me for a friend and you got somebody you can pay to do stuff, man, you can come up with some funny stuff to get them to do. So I was, I was a preacher's kid, so I could take an offering. So, so <laughs> I'd get, hey, guys, give me some money. Give me, what are we going to do? I said, we're going to get Ray to do so-and-so. And so, like, for instance, one time we are in the class, and back then you had, had these speakers on the wall, and you could pull a chain and I know that sounds funny at all. You pull a chain and you can talk to the office because that's how they kind of, and so you pull the chain, you speak to it, right? I said, he said, what do I have to do? I said, I said, go up there, pull the chain and speak to our principal and tell him, hey, how's it going, man? He goes, how much are you going to give me? We got $3.17. Yeah, that's a fortune. And for, for all you younger people, that's like $1,000 in our money today. But um, so we, we give him some money, $3. I mean, he's going to give his life away. Yeah, he got some serious trouble, but he says it's worth $3. So he does it. Well, so we're always doing that. Well, we're at lunch one day, the crew, you know, we're all there, and, and there was this girl. Now, we were either juniors or seniors. We were upperclassmen. And there was this girl who had come to our church school, and she was a freshman. And she was cute, man. And we'll call her Susie. And so Susie, that wasn't her name. Susie... Uh, he just, man, he just fell in love with this girl. Like, and he, this guy never had a girlfriend. He wanted, he wanted one so bad. In fact, he's always saying, hey, would you put a good word in with me for, for me with so-and-so? And I'm thinking, if she's worth it, <laughs> no, sir. I'm going to keep her to myself if I could do that, you know. So he's always trying to get me to set him up with somebody. And so, man, he was crazy about this. He's always talking about Susie. Susie, she's cute. Look at her brown, look at her curly blonde hair. And, oh, she's, oh, she's beautiful. She's so sweet, blah, 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 blah. So, so I said, hey, guys, we, we got to do something. I saw her sitting over there with the freshman cheerleaders. I said, hey, let's come here. So I'm taking a collection. <laughs> we take the collection up. I got a bunch of change in my pocket. I said, dude, we, we got a deal for you guys. How much is it going to pay? I said, well, let me tell you what it is first. I said, you got to go over, and, and, and there's Susie over there. He said, yeah, I know. He was weak need. I said, you got to go over, and you got to kneel down and say, Susie, I love you with all my heart. Not only do I want you to be my girlfriend, will you be my wife? He goes, what does it pay? I go, $2.83. All right, man, I'll do it. So we watch him. He goes over. He kneels down. We see him do all the stuff. We couldn't hear him, but we saw the girls start laughing. The girl turned red, and she'd go now laugh. He comes back, I want my money. Well, that was fine and good, but, you know, in my day, and I don't know how it works in high schools now, but my day, when you had some time and lunch, you had certain places, certain groups went. There were certain hangouts, and we had, we had different groups. In my school, we had... We had what we called the rednecks, and we had what we called the freaks. Anybody remember those days? The freaks, you know, the rednecks were what most everybody in our school was, but we had freaks. They were, the ones, they were sitting around the back of the building smoking pot, and then we had, you know, we had the athletes, the jocks over here and different ones. So, so me and my group are over here talking before we go to class, and all of a sudden Ray comes running in, oh, help, help, help. These guys are going to kill me. I said, what? He said, man, there's like 12 big rednecks. I saw them coming. They said they're going to, he didn't say beat me up. He said something else. And he said, man, I, what am I going to do? I said, hey, you know, there's like 14 of us, 12, 14 of us. I said, dude, don't worry about it. Dude, we got this. They come, we got this. Anybody's like, yeah, man. Let them come in here. We got your back, buddy. So one of the guys that came was a friend of ours I knew since we were little kids. He comes and says, hey, Tommy. And that's what I was called back then. I said, what's, the man? what's up, man? He says, well, we need to speak to Ray. I said, is all you going to do? He goes, uh, yeah. That's all right. Well, I'm coming with you. We're, we're, we got this. So we all go strolling out in this front area of this building. And all of a sudden, 14 big guys, all bigger than me, surrounded us. But I knew I was okay because I had my crew. You know what my crew was? 
me and Ray, because the rest of them were looking through the window going, yeah, man. <laughs> First time in my life, then I knew my life was flashing before my eyes. <laughs> Fortunately, they saw what happened and laughed so hard that it went on by, and it, and it came a sigh of relief, and it ended up being okay. But, you know, I, that, I won't sit here and tell you I was trying to do something spiritual. You know, if I, not being very spiritual at the time, was willing to stop my friend from being picked on, how much more will your heavenly father step up and say, you're not picking on my kids anymore. I'm standing in the gap for you. And that's exactly what God wants to do. He wants to come to your situation. And he wants to step up and say, you're not picking on my boy. You're not picking on my girl. Come on, somebody. That alone ought to bless us. Right? So the devil hates that. He's going to try to do everything he can to come against you. So, so what we want to do is we want to get in a place where we get God on the scene. Right? You know, not just, not just Tommy, <laughs> but Tommy and all the other idiots looking through 14 pairs of eyes, looking through the window. Yeah, man, we're going to get. And when the end of it's over, they're like, yeah, we were going to come out there if we had to. <laughs> yeah, thank you very much. I appreciate it. I'm just glad my nose isn't on the side of my face now. That's just. <laughs> but we want to get God on the scene. Here it is. Ready? Write this down. The way we get God on the scene, we have to believe his promise. You got to know it. All right? You, 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 you got to believe it, but you can't believe what you don't know. It's important, and so the enemy wants to steal that word from you because he knows if you get a hold of the promise, he's doomed. Come on, some of you, you're going through something. The reason you're still struggling for too long is because you don't know his promise. Get his promise. Come on, you'll get through it. Daniel 3, now go to verse 16. See, we got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. They knew something. They, they knew something. They knew exactly what the deal was. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego answered and said to the king, Oh, Nebuchadnezzar, we have no need to answer you in this matter. If this is the case, our God whom we serve is able to deliver us from the burning fiery furnace, and he will deliver us from your hand, O king. See, there's a notion in Christian circles that goes like this. How many believe God's able? Come on, how many believe God's able? Hope there's more than six. How many believe God's able? How many believe he's able to deliver? Come on. How many believe he's able to heal? Come on. How many believe he's able to, to do whatever you need? He's able to do more than you can ever imagine. How many? Then why is he not doing it? Uh. 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 Write this down. It's not enough to know what to know that he's able. We have to know what he's willing to do. A lot of people believe he's able. But they're not sure what his will is. And so when he doesn't move, they make up doctrines. And we make up doctrines and say, well, it didn't happen, so it wasn't God's will. And his word told us what his will is. So they say, well, it must not be his will this time for me. That's a trick of the devil. Because we so often are trying to spout something we don't know in our heart. See, but apparently, these three, we used to call them three Hebrew children. They knew something, huh? So they said, we know, we know, not only do we know God can do it, what'd they say? Huh, he didn't, they didn't say our God is, is able, they said that, but look, keep reading. And he will deliver us. Listen, they didn't go to the furnace thinking they're going to burn up and just hoping they make it. They went to the furnace expecting to be delivered from the fire. They weren't worried about getting burned up, that's not what this was about. And so often we've looked at that and thought, they were just like, well, God, if you... Come through, great. If you don't come through, we're still going to serve you, Lord. That's kind of how we take it. Because in verse 18, they said, But if not, let it be known to you, O king, that we do not serve your gods, nor will we worship the gold image which you've set up. So here's what we used to think. But if not, we thought, well, either God delivers us, but if he doesn't, we're not going to worship your, your idol. Well, listen, think about that, how stupid that is. That doesn't make sense. If you don't throw us in the furnace, we're not worshiping. But if you throw us in the furnace and worship, uh, burn us to pieces, we're not going to worship. Well, no kidding. If you're a crispy critter, how are you going to worship? They weren't talking about what was going to happen to them. They were talking about what he had a choice to do because they knew they had favor. Go back and read Daniel 1 and 2. You'll find out they had incredible favor. They had so much favor, they were allowed to not eat the meat of idols. Do you understand in that culture, that would have been a slap at their God. No, we won't touch that because our God says, no, we'll eat vegetables only. We're not going to eat that because it's, it's been a sacrifice to idols. And the king let them do that. They were some of the wisest men in all of the kingdom. And so he knew these things about them. And so they said, no, listen, we're not doing that. Now, king, we know you love us. And we know you care about us, and I'll show you that again in a minute. And so if you decide you're not going to send us to the furnace because of the favor we have, we're still not going to bow. They weren't saying, 
If God comes through, God doesn't come through. We're not worshiping your idol. That's not what they're saying. They expected God to come through. They're saying, if you decide to deliver us or not, we trust one God, and we're going to serve one God, because we're not burning either way. You know, so that's what they're saying. Keep reading that, huh? The difference between deliverance and getting burned, we have to know what God's promises are. We have to know what his will is. We have to know what he says. And too many people in the body of Christ have no clue what God says. We, we speak half-truths and half-verses and hope, you know, so some, well, my, my grandmother said so-and-so, or man, Aunt Mabel always said so-and-so. What does the Word say? And if you're going through a situation, your Word needs to be what God gives you for your situation. Sometimes Aunt Mabel's Word might be good for her, but if you don't know what the Bible says for you, you're going to burn. How many want to get through it and not get burned? Come on. How many want to get through it and not get burned? Nobody wants to get burned, right? Well, he's got a plan to get you out of it. Come on. Write this down. We can never turn the tables on the devil until we are convinced of what God will do. Now, let me prove it to you. How many have a study Bible? You actually got a real Bible in your hand right now. Look in your Bible. There's, there's some Bible like mine has, has margins down the middle of each, each side of the page. And it has all these references. Anybody see that? Or at the bottom. Anybody got those kind of references? Look along there somewhere and see if, it, if there's somewhere in there in this chapter that it references uh, Isaiah. A verse from Isaiah. Isaiah 43.2. Do you see that? Somebody's nodding right there. You see that? It's somewhere on that page. It'll rev- this is so, so I remember the first time I saw this. I mean, it, this is when the light bulb went off for me. When I found this verse as part of the reference. Okay? So Isaiah 43.2. This will show you how come I know that they didn't expect to be burned. So let's go to Isaiah 43, 2. And this is how it will bring it personally to each one of us. All right? This is what God says through Isaiah. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they shall not overflow you. When you walk through the fire, you shall not be burned, nor shall the flame scorch you. Well, that's cool they knew that, but listen, let me tell you what's really special about this. That verse was prophetically spoken to Isaiah before Judah was taken away to captivity and exile. And he said, this is what's about to happen. So you serve me, and that's what we'll do if we're not careful. We'll give lip service, but our life doesn't line up with the word. And so that's what Judah had done. They'd been you know, serving God in name only, but their lifestyle didn't line up with what they said. And so it caused them to be carried off to the enemy's nation and camp. And so they've been there for years and years and years. But before they went, God said, listen, they're going to take you. But listen to me. You're going to get captured. You're going to be taken to another empire. And you're going to cross rivers. And, And listen, there weren't a lot of rivers in Israel. And it was a scary thing. Look, they didn't go swimming just for a pastime. They'd seen people drown in the rivers. That's why two of the greatest miracles God did in the Old Testament Testament was having his people walk across what used to be water. And they walked across some dry ground. That was huge to them because water was fearsome to them. They were afraid. They had seen people dry to die many times and drown. They wouldn't, they wouldn't be like, hey, let's go down to the river and swim. No, that was not happening. And he said, look, you're going to cross rivers. And even the mighty Euphrates, they had to go across. That was a scary river. It was huge. He said, you're going to cross. Don't worry about it. The water's not going to overflow you. You're not going to drown. You're not going to get, you're not, you're not going to have any problems. You're going to get through it, and you're going to come out over there. And so they said, look, he promised us this. Look, we went through the water. We didn't drown. Well, the rest of the verse says, then we can go through the fire, and we won't be burned. So they knew already, they'd seen God's promise, and they're standing on it, and we need to get to the place. And God needs to show you, this is what my promise is for you. But you can't stand on what you don't know. And the only way to turn the tables on the devil is to get God's word on the matter. On the matter. So God sent them a word before they got carried off. Don't you worry. Rivers, no problem. Fires, no worries. I got this. Huh? If he led us through the water... And across the rivers, he's going to be with us through the fire. Man, that ought to make somebody excited. But here's what you've got to understand. God does not respond just because you know some scripture. He responds because he knows your heart. You know why he responded to Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? Yeah, they knew the scripture, but he knew their hearts. See, what their, their hope was founded on on the anchor of the word, but their heart lined up with what God's word said. Come on, come on. You know, because if you just throw out words, 
you're going to have like the sons of Sceva in, in Acts. You know that story? They, they came up against the demoniac, and they start going, hey, uh, against the, 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 the God and the Jesus that Paul preaches, I'll cast you out. And that thing went all over them and beat them up so bad they ran out of the house. The Bible says beat up and naked. You've been whooped when they rip your clothes off too. I'm just saying. You know, I've been in some fights before, thank God. Not that kind. I'm thankful for that. But here's three, we used to call them the Hebrew children. Here are the three young Hebrew men who had, God had used mightily. And God didn't respond just because they knew Scripture. He responded because he had watched them and they had lived it. And he had seen and made sure they had favor. And up until this point, the king had looked on them with favor. In fact, he treated them, he, he thought them as sons. And the reason he called them in was because he's thinking, you know, listen, I don't, want, I don't want you to die. He didn't want them to die. They were valuable to him. They, helped, they, they gave him wisdom when some of the other people didn't have it because they had godly wisdom. And there were times when they saved the kingdom and he needed them. So he calls them in, tries to reason with them. He wasn't trying to say, you need to worship my God. He was trying to say, look, if you don't do this, I'm going to look bad. Because now it will undermine my authority. And the next time I say some people, oh, I don't worry about it. He won't really do it because, look, he didn't do anything to them. So it was about personal pride, not about the fact that he was mad because they didn't worship the idol, because he knew before he built it that they didn't worship idols. But now he's called on the carpet, now he's been caught in, in, a, in a quandary because of what he did, and they go, King, sorry, we don't mean to disrespect you, but we're not bowing. He got so mad that he did something senseless. How many of you know when you get mad, you'll do stupid stuff? Come on, any men here? I don't know what women do, but men... How many of us have done something stupid when we got mad? Here's what he did. It's, 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 think about this. He got so mad, the Bible said he turned the furnace up seven times hotter. Now, this is, this is kind of how I think. My wife can tell you that I do this kind of stuff all the time. I'm like, that makes no sense to me. Think of what he did. Okay, I'm going to show them. I want to make it so hot it's going to kill the people that throw them in. Yeah, I'll teach them a lesson. How stupid is that? I mean, if I thought about it, wait, I thought, if he really is mad at him, what he should do is turn it down. Like, you know, about 200 where we roast pork butts and stuff and cook them for three days. Right? I mean, they die instantly. He's doing them a favor. But he's mad, so he's doing something stupid. He's not thinking. He, he just, he's so furious. He's lost his mind. But here's the cool thing. God. God says, oh, right. turn it 18 times harder. I don't care because I got something, huh? And, and, and God does what he always does. Listen, the fire was there. They get thrown in. And the only thing that burned up was the sign of their bondage, the bounds, the bindings burned off. But their clothes didn't burn. The hair didn't even get singed. Anybody ever had their hair singed? My big brother sitting right there. I remember in high school, dad was out of town, and back then you had to physically light our central heat. Dad had chill feel. You remember Phil? I know you do. I'm getting ready in, the, in there. We had one bathroom, three bedroom, one bathhouse. I'm brushing my teeth. He's lighting the heater, and all I, all I see is a boom, a flash in the whole house. <laughs> and Phil comes walking in, and his hair is singed, his eyebrows, his eyelashes are singed. And back in the day when you had the perfect hair, he was singed all over. It was pretty funny. So funny he couldn't go to school that day, I don't think. So, 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 I mean, if you went through the fire and it singed your hair, but you came, that's okay. At least I'm alive, right? No, their hair wasn't singed. They didn't even smell like smoke. But listen, not only that, the king, the thing he knows, he didn't say, hey, they're not burning up. He didn't say, they didn't die. He said, hey, we threw three in there, right? I see Jesus in there. He said, one that looks like the Son of God. So Jesus shows up hundreds of years before he's born into the earth, and he shows up because they stood on the word. The Bible says he is the word of God become flesh. He says, look, you stood on the word, so I just showed it to remind you. God already gave you a word. I've already got something. God's got this. We're going to get out of this, and not only that, God's going to promote you. Come on, somebody. I mean, that just felt like somebody would get excited about that. So he's so impressed. He's so impressed. How many look, look, listen just a little bit faster so we can get done? Okay. In fact, the band can come on back. Come on, Shauna, come on back. 
Verse 29, therefore, this is the, after he sees this, changed his tune. Therefore, I decree, or I make it a decree, that any people, nation, or language which speaks anything amiss against the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego shall be cut in pieces, and their houses shall be made in ash heap. Now, that's just a nice way of saying dung heap. The, region, the original Hebrew says dung. Yeah, and dung is exactly what you think it is. Because there is no other God who can deliver like this. Do you understand what happened? This didn't happen in a back room. This didn't happen and nobody saw it. You understand, we've been told several times, what, 30 or 40 it seems like when you read through it, that everybody who was anybody was here to witness this. And they came to see an image, but they didn't go home talking about a 90-foot statue. They went home talking about the God who delivers in the middle of a fire. And the whole known world began to proclaim the name that is above every name. And everything changed that moment. Do you understand when the devil comes against you? He's messing with the wrong person. When he tries to take God's people, when we'll stand on the word of God and we'll get a promise, no matter what he brings our way, we don't even have to get our hair messed up. Come on, somebody. That's the promise. And that's what you do when you turn the table on the devil. But look at this. Isn't it great that God's name was glorified? The devil tried to mess him up and it blew up in his face. Isn't that awesome? They go home talking about God, not the statue. And that's, that's enough. But look at verse 30. Then the king promoted. Now, remember, I told you they already had favor. They were some of the highest in the land. They went through this hellish ordeal. They go through the fire. And then the Bible says, then the king promoted. By the way, that word promoted in Hebrew literally means caused to prosper. Uh -huh. The king promoted Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego in the province of Babylon. Oh, look, they already had favor. They already had blessing. They're already in God's hand. And God says, let me show you. Because you were faithful, I'm going to get glory from this, but I'm going to share some of that with you. Let me see if I can cause you to prosper a little bit more. I don't know about somebody else, but that makes me want to shout and run around a little bit. Come on, somebody. Lift up the name of Jesus because what you're going through is going to turn out for your good. Come on. Here's the point. We're going to wrap this up. God will use what the devil brings against us to release mighty blessings in our lives. You know what needs to happen? When the devil, how his report system works and his little demons come back and say, Hey, I want to tell you, we attacked her. We got some bad news. God already turned it around. You know what the devil starts saying? Man, don't mess with her no more. Let's go find somebody else. Because she always stands on the word. Don't mess with him because he's got the promises of God. He has the word of God. Listen, when you attack him, let me tell you, you woke up on the wrong side of the bed to mess with that person. Let's find somebody else because I got news for you. We can't beat them when they stand with God. And that's where God wants you today. And that's what he wants to do for us. He wants to turn the tables. He wants to turn your situation. No matter what it looks like, no matter what you're facing today, we have to move beyond believing what he can do knowing what he will do. And I want to tell you, he will do it. Say it with me. He will do it. Say it again. He will do it. One more time. He will do it. Stand to your feet and give him praise. Come on. Come on. Oh, come on, church. Hallelujah. Would you raise your hands? Let me pray for you. Father, in the name of Jesus. God, I just know in this house there are some who are facing, it seems like, insurmountable odds. Some who feel like they're in the fire right now. They're feeling the heat. But look, that promise will come alive in them. They know, God, you, you've got this. We'll trust you. That it doesn't have to turn against us. That you can turn it for good. But not just, not just to get us through it, but to bless us in spite of what the devil means. Lord, that marriage situation, the problem in the family, the, the business decision that maybe was the wrong one at the time, Lord, you're still able to move beyond that. I trust you now. God, you can still heal our marriage. You can still heal, heal our home. You can still heal my body. You can still move. And I expect that. I, I know not only are you able, but you will. You will. You will. In Jesus' name, everybody say it. Amen. Now let's worship him together. Before Pastor Jeremy comes and wraps us up uh, today. Sing a
you're always faithful and always dependable and you always come through and you're always true to your word. We give you praise and honor for that. Can we give God praise for that today in Jesus' name? Oh, glory to God. Praise the Lord. Listen, we're going to wrap things up, but I want to tell you, if you're not in relationship with Jesus Christ, if you say today, I don't know what it means to be a Christian, or I do know what it means, and can I tell you the truth, Pastor Jeremy, today I'm not right with God. Our altar team is coming forward right now, and in just a moment, we're going to be dismissed, but you have an opportunity to step forward today to receive the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior. Or you can also come up to receive prayer for any needs going on in your life. So that means that nobody's going to know why you're coming up, right? So you got you have full anonymity. And also, let me, or, or at least you got an excuse. And let me tell you this too. We have a discipleship program that's eight weeks long where we help you get started in the process of discipleship. You meet with an altar team member once a week for eight weeks, and they help you get disciple. If you want to know the things of God, what does it mean really to, to know that I'm saved? Why do I need to be baptized in water? What are some of these basic tenets of the faith? We will we'll do that for you. We will put you through that program. We'll give you a Bible if you don't have one. We got it covered. The people in our church want to make sure that you have every opportunity to get to know Jesus and to be in a great relationship with Him. So let me encourage you today in just a moment when I pray, take a step and step out of your seat. Take a step of faith today and say, I want to get right with God. I want to receive prayer. I want to get started in this discipleship journey. If you're watching us online or even here in person today or on TV later, and you would like to give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ today, you can do that and let us know by texting 180 to 251-639-1959. A 180 means I was headed one direction. I am making a turn. I am making a change. I am headed in the direction of God. I have given my life to Jesus. No turning back. If you'll text us, we will call you. We will follow up with you. Get a link back from us with some resources so that you can get started in your journey with Jesus because giving your life to Jesus is the very best decision that you could ever make. And so today, make a step, make a change. It will be worth it, I promise. Let me pray for you, and we will be dismissed, and you'll have an opportunity to step up today. If you have an offering envelope as you're dismissed out these double doors, you can drop it in one of our boxes on the way out. Father, thank you for letting us come to church. Thank you for the life change that's happened here. Now I pray for every soul, every person. Lord, maybe there's one today who needs to come to find hope in life through Jesus. Maybe there's one here who's struggling, who just needs some prayer and the support of their church family. I pray right now by your Holy Spirit that you would prick their heart. Lord, and give them the courage to step forward today to receive prayer and life in Jesus' name. Amen. Don't forget about PFC Groups Wednesday night. Even if you don't sign up, show up. We got room for you. Be a part of what God is doing here at PFC. Step forward now for prayer. Otherwise, you're dismissed. God bless you.